does not uh, hold you. Uh, I mean, it doesn't again, make um, you uh, <laughs> immune to uh, any legal uh, suits. Yeah, that's yes, what I want. Yes. To. Is it uh, visible, my screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Visible, sir. Okay. So informed consent is grounded in an ethical and legal concept. The patients have the right to understand what is being done to their bodies, which uh, Tilak, I think, mentioned personal autonomy. This is called personal autonomy and agree to the potential consequences of the intervention, that is self-determination and self-decision. These are the two terminologies that should be included in your answer. Ethical and legal concept and uh, it is uh, uh, for the personal autonomy of the patient and his own self-determination and self-decision. This first common, <clears throat> the first common law, battery. The battery is not the, the cell which we use for our uh, uh, art plates or other uh, cell phones or anything. The legal battery is performance or touching a patient itself is called battery. In the common law, battery it is the performance of a procedure, even unauthorized touching uh, is thought to be, uh, may have been performed without negligence. The second is a negligent failure to warn and arises where the healthcare professional fails to warn the patient or instruct him of alternative methods of treatment that are available. And uh, failure to obtain a consent compresses patient uh, compromises patient autonomy may increase patient safety risk due to incomplete patient clinician communication it may constitute negligence if you have not obtained informed consent it is a negligence but anything goes wrong it will be very seriously viewed and uh, it will be battery that is you have unlawfully done something to the body of the patient and the breach of contract and or other legal claims may lead to professional discipline. So uh, these five points are very important. Why you have to get the informed consent? If you have not got it, it is compromising the patient's autonomy. The patient has to decide whether he wants to undergo a procedure or not. It may increase the safety risk and uh, uh, it may constitute negligence on the part of the treating doctor. It will be like a battery that is unlawfully causing some injury to the patient, breach of contract or other legal claims. And a robust patient-centered informed consent process is a model of shared decision making which enhances patient safety, improves patient satisfaction, meets ethical and legal duty to the patient, increases staff morale, reduces legal risk to healthcare providers and organization, and helps to ensure compliance with regulatory and accreditation requirements. So if you do this or obtain the informed consent, these are all the advantages. It enhances patient safety, improves his satisfaction, meets ethical and legal duty, increases staff morale, reduces legal risk and ensures compliance to the rules and regulations. And informed consent is much more than a signed form. The anesthesia professional and the patient develop the anesthesia plan through discussion of alternatives and risks and benefits of the plan. So you can discuss all these things, why you want to give a spinal for a TKR instead of DA. You may say after uh, three hours when the effect wears off that the surgeon would like to make you stand up and walk. Nowadays they are doing it so early. But if you are under GA it may be a little difficult. So it is better that you undergo. Bleeding will be less. You, are, uh, you can start resuming your oral intake faster. All these things you can tell the patient and make him and get convinced for a spinal for a TKR. So this is how you talk to the patient and convince them and uh, explain the risks and benefits and then make them understand that and give their consent. Now, elements of anesthesia informed consent process, how do you do that? First is competence and decision-making capacity. You must make sure that the patient has the competence and ability to take the decision. The patient has the legal authority to consent, which is called the competence, and he has got the ability to decide understand what you say and then give the concern which is called the capacity 
and disclosure of information, which I think this is that said, patient is adequately informed of relevant information. Supposing you suggest spinal for a hernia or a TKR or a floor in surgery, you must tell what are all the advantages. Many patients nowadays, you know, they will ask you, will I develop a backache? Because my friend had a spinal and now he is having a chronic backache. Is it uh, possible that I also will get that? You have to convince them that it is not um, the spinal which is causing the problem. Probably your friend had already some back problem which was uh, got uh, aggravated because of other reason. And uh, you must uh, also tell you may develop a post spinal headache. Otherwise, uh, if you develop the headache uh, after 24 hours or 48 hours, that may be lack of uh, disclosure of information. So adequately inform the patient of uh, the relevant needs, but don't threaten them by saying that if you don't undergo this, you will die. Uh, like that, it should not be a threatening to make the patient give the consent. And nature of purpose of the proposed anesthesia technique should be explained to the patient. The risk benefits and side effects of anesthesia techniques also should be informed. Alternatives and their risks and benefits and side effects should be also mentioned. Risks of not receiving the anesthesia care also should be explained. You must tell them what will happen if you don't take this uh, anesthesia and have the surgery. Now coming to understanding of the disclosed information. It is not enough that you just tell them all these things. You must say, uh, say whether the patient has understood that. The patient should demonstrate understanding of the information disclosed and presented by the anesthesia professional. And he must give the consent voluntarily. The patient voluntarily consents to a planned anesthesia care in the absence of any pressure, coercion, or duress. And it should be documented. Very, very important. Healthcare record contains appropriate documentation evidence evidencing the patient's informed consent for anesthesia. And coming to competence and decision making, competence refers to patient's legal authority to make healthcare decisions. Most states consider a patient to be competent unless otherwise determined by the court. And if they are more than 18 years old, they are competent enough. Minors, when it comes to minors, generally parents or legal guardians are the legally competent people to give the consent. Unless uh, uh, minors, uh, so some, some the exceptional circumstances, minors also can give. Depending upon the particular state law, these ex uh, some exceptions may be given to them. Like uh, if they are uh, already emancipated, that is freed or from the, any constraints by the court of our law, or if they are married, below 18 if they are married, engage in military service, living independently from their parents, self-sufficient and homeless, and if they are pregnant, or if they already have a kid, or if they are high school graduates, all these are eligible to give their own consent, and seeking specific types of health treatment, like pregnancy-related or mental health treatment or drug or alcohol abuse treatment, all these patients have their own ability to give the consent. Even if the minor does not have the legal authority to consent, he or she should be included in the informed consent discussion if developmentally appropriate. If they are in an understandable age, if they can comprehend what you are saying, the minors also should be included in the discussion. And his and her cooperation is, uh, should be sought. And coming to the decision making capacity should be not confused with competence or legal authority to provide consent. Decision making capacity refers to the patient's ability to make a meaningful decision at a specific time about whether or not to undergo anesthesia, including appreciating the significance of the anesthesia plan of care and its potential consequences. The anesthesia professional evaluates the patient and determines capacity to make the specific healthcare decision. Now, if the patient has received any anxiolytic drugs or analgesic, then the anesthesia professional has to uh, decide whether the patient has the decision making capacity or anything. And considering the medication's effect and the patient's demonstration of rational reasoning and understanding. So, some patients may be 
partially on uh, restil or alprozolam or uh, uh, anxiolytic agents, mood elevator, psychiatric drugs. And those patients, you have to, the examining doctor is responsible for assessing whether his understanding capacity is uh, good enough or not. If the patient decision making capacity raises concern, if you are worried about it, the anesthesia professional may even ask for a mini mental state examination or seeking a psychiatric help before you take up uh, or accept his uh, decision making. Once a determination has been made, it is important to document the determination of the patient's deciding capacity, objective facts supporting the decision and the consultation or opinion obtained with regard to that. And patients who are or uh, become incapacitated. Uh, for example, the patient with a stroke, he's aphasic, he's not able to talk. Instead of, uh, but he may be comprehending what you say. Uh, so in that situation, what to do? That, then the uh, person who he delegates his right, they can make a decision on behalf of them. So in accordance to law, that has to be taken care. This designation continues throughout the patient's anesthesia care unless the patient himself withdraws that uh, delegation. So, so, for example, an 80 year old man who had a stroke, who has become aphasic, he has to undergo a hernia, and everything is explained, and he is able to listen and then comprehend what you are saying. But he cannot express back and say, Yes, I agree, or, or all that. Then he may just show his hand to his daughter or son standing nearby. Then on their his behalf, the son or daughter can give the informed consent until the time he suppose he can write and say, yeah, my daughter or son cannot take any more of the decisions. I will just uh, sign and write and show. Then in that case, you can revoke that until such time the uh, patient has the right to delegate the uh, decision making to whom he wants to. And coming to the disclosure of information, anesthesia professional provides the patient with adequate information that is relevant and helpful in making a decision. And informed concern begins with an explanation of patient's decision-making role and continues as an interactive process of communication, both alternative risks and benefits during which the patient is encouraged to ask questions and related to anesthesia care that are addressed by the anesthesia professional. And information if applicable to anesthesia care about goals of care, possible recovery concern and post anesthesia period should also be discussed. So the discussion should not only for intraoperative, but also it should include postoperative problems and how the patient have, will be taken care of in the postoperative phase. And the degree of disclosure regarding the risk and benefits varies according to some state and local law. Many jurisdictions use a reasonable person standard, which is material to reasonable person's decision. Risks that should be disclosed are reasonably foreseeable, but it does not have to include every possible risk. That is, for example, you need not say that there is a 1% chance you may even die on the table. That need not be told if it is a very remote one, but all reasonable uh, risks should be explained to the patient. And material risks are those that the reasonable person would want to be made aware of when she makes a decision. And uh, these include the risks that commonly occur and those that are rare but may result in severe morbidity and mortality also should be explained. Some jurisdictions use the professional practice standard or what reasonable practitioner should disclose under similar circumstances. Now, what are all the special considerations for informed consent? Disclosure of unplanned conversion to general anesthesia. For example, you say we will do a TKR and spinal, and the patient agrees, he has given the informed consent. But unfortunately, on the table, the surgery gets prolonged and spinal is wearing off then you have no other choice to convert it. You have told the patient. But if you have not told earlier that there is a possibility that, that uh, if the surgery gets prolonged, I may convert it to general anesthesia. If you have not told it, and if you are going to do it and plan, 
the anesthesia professional discusses with the patient the need for possible conversion in the event of inadequate sedation or regional anesthesia and the discussion of possible modifications of the plan allows the patient the opportunity to discuss any concerns he or she may have related to general anesthesia and understanding the disclosed information which i said earlier the patient must demonstrate sufficient understanding and uh, variables such as language cultural and religious belief health literacy and health impairments may impact a patient's understanding the procedure so this is very very important so every explanation should be given in a language that the patient understands that is a very important thing that is why if you see many of the hospitals will have an informed consent printed in english as well as in tamil if you go to andhra it may be in telugu and in uh, english if you go to western country i mean uh, northern states it may be in hindi as well as english uh, for legal purposes so the language is very very important and uh, it should be voluntary upon completing the informed consent discussion the patient expresses the right to make the informed decisions about anesthesia care voluntariness is very important exaggerating the harm of not consenting the recommended care or benefits or accepting the care also may be considered as a question that's what i told you you should not say or uh, um, verify the patient saying that it may end up uh, the you may die and all that unless you give the consent that uh, that again becomes a uh, duress or compulsion and the patient has the right to withhold consent revoke consent or provide consent after initially withholding or giving them so any time he wants he can say i don't want to go through i can uh, or revoke whatever i have accepted and coming to documentation following the interactive development of anesthesia plan and informed consent discussion the patient or legal decision maker consents to the anesthesia and signs the anesthesia informed consent document indicating the date and time and relationship if applicable the informed consent should not be signed until the patient's questions have been answered to his or her satisfaction witness signatures verify that the witness saw the patient or the patient's legal decision maker sign the document identify an appropriate available witness all signatures should have the date and time noted if significant changes to the agreed anesthesia plan occur after the patient is sedated or anesthetized the reasons for the change should be documented in the anesthesia record so you give you give a block upper limb block you give sedation and then uh, halfway through you want to change the plan then you should document it in the anesthesia record why it was uh, changed from the uh, what was planned earlier and formal documentation of informed consent provides evidence that the informed consent process has been completed and substantiates billing and may help protect anesthesia professional from legal liability or disciplinary action in case the patient subsequently challenges the proposed care and timing of anesthesia informed consent process some facility policies will allow for informed consent to be obtained within a specific time period prior to the surgery regardless of policy or other requirements the process form should be based on patient's current physical fitness the patient's condition changes after the process has been completed then the risk benefit everything get changed so the anesthesia professional should engage the informed consent process again if there is a change in the patient's condition including the documentation process what about emergencies and the implied consent immediate treatment or intervention is warranted because the patient is unconscious or capable of consenting and the harm from failing to perform a procedure is imminent and outweighs the potential harm for performing the procedure for example a road traffic accident case patient comes with a gcs of 3 or 4 uh, then in the er you have to immediately intubate the patient to save his life so there it is not necessary that you should have the informed consent for that so 
if a true emergency exists consent is not required since it is implied that patient has agreed that is why he has come to the hospital otherwise he could have been in the site of accident itself emergency should be documented in patient's record and when patient status permits the healthcare professional should attempt to secure the consent of the legal decision maker or if there is no legal decision maker close family members withholding information anesthesia professionals must offer all patients the opportunity to discover receive relevant healthcare information some patients may limit the scope of information they wish to receive some patients may say doctor you do whatever best for me don't tell me the details i am scared of needles and uh, pricks and uh, uh, hospital so if you think it is safe for me just go ahead you don't have to tell me everything in detail if that comes from the patient himself then you have the right to waive the information they have the right to waive the information and you need not tell them completely they may want certain information to be withheld to involve family members or caregivers in that case it should be kept confident and uh, anesthesia professionals with uh, within the limits of applicable legal requirement should respect their patients voluntary choices about receiving healthcare uh, information after educating them about the informed consent process and shared decision making consent in special situations critical care and emergency jehovah's witness obstetric patients chronic pain treatment research work and uh, the following guidelines will be uh, will be like a take take home message it should be for a specific procedure it should be given voluntarily by the competent patient common less common and less likely complications also should be explained risk related to patient's comorbidity should be explained adequate time should be given to read and understand the consent form should be given honest answer should be given to patient's question patient should be given the choice to choose from various anesthetic options given whole discussion and patient's decision for intervention should be precisely documented in patient vernacular language patient should sign the form after carefully going through and you can add to this there should be a witness also and date and time should be mentioned okay so that is the so whatever points uh, you think has been left out you can uh, sir in an emergency in an uh, in an institution uh, sometimes in an emergency like the gcs score is uh, 2 or 3 and uh, need to intubate and all that and take them up for surgery the resident medical officer uh, can uh, uh, intervene and uh, sign the form no sir yes. rmo yeah. yeah they can do that if supposing no attender or anybody is available and the patient's condition is critical and warrants an immediate intervention then that can be done if, uh, if, uh, if it is a really a life threatening emergency and if it is documented uh, informed consent is automatically in place so you don't have to worry yes, about that yes sir but you should Recording be holding the information in the name of uh, privacy and patient's uh, uh, personal choice to so withhold the specific health status information from the relatives before going to surgery and later yes. on if the patient is not existing and uh, the relatives come and uh, feel that uh, information is not given to them hmm. it will be a difficult situation for the doctor sir so whatever uh, confidential information is uh, given by the patient but ask the uh, ask the doctor to withhold from the uh, bystander or family relative is there yes. any other safe Documented. mechanism like involving some legal person to Uh, confidentially document it. Yeah, if you have documented yeah. it, it's not an issue. Yes, sir. If uh, the patient but, uh, is uh, saying himself, saying that don't reveal this to anybody, then it should be a confidential uh, document which should not be uh, revealed to his close relatives. You can get a third person. We should document that also. We should document that also and say that the patient has said that, and make him sign. then we are not at a problem at all 
Yes, yes. Yeah. But the point should be well highlighted, sir. Actually, whatever uh, information in, we need not this, uh, write down the information relevant, but such a request has come from the patient that has to be documented and the patient can be made to sign. Yes. Like uh, also do organ donation. Now it is they also do uh, a video documentation. Video documentation, yes. Yeah. Yeah, that point also you have to include. Uh, it's, not, it's not given in this. Uh, so yes, so you can record the whole conversation with the patient and uh, keep it as an evidence. Then yes. uh, that also is uh, agreed up, 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 through the informed consent in the court of law. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, madam.